The House and Senate face the bill passage deadline called crossover. We follow bills covering abortion, voter ID, and using lethal self-defense. And lawmakers reach a deal on the charter school cap. It's next. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Hello again, thanks for watching. I'm Kelly McCullen. This week, hundreds of bills faced a deadline to either get passed or die legislatively in the House or Senate. Now, passing those bills required some late night legislative sessions and saw controversial bills placed front and center for debate. A bill lifting the charter schools cap in North Carolina was a few months ago one such controversial bill. But House and Senate leaders changed the original bill's provisions. It gained Democratic lawmakers and now apparently Governor Beth Perdue's support. The House and Senate reached a deal to completely remove the cap on the number of charter schools that can operate throughout North Carolina. Senate Bill 8 gives the State Board of Education the power of granting new charters and setting charter school standards. And charter schools would get five years to meet those academic standards before facing possible sanctions. The bill was changed from an earlier version that had partisan disagreement. What we have in this conference report is a lowest common denominator, that is um, what, what can pass and what can become law today. The legislation will allow traditional public school systems to convert low-performing schools into charter schools. Public school backers like this flexibility to reform traditional campuses. If you give us that flexibility in some of the schools when we see things that we could change uh, and could do that ourselves as, as the regular pop, traditional public schools, we could make those schools better. The charter school bill passed the House 108 to 5, the final vote that sends this bill to Governor Bev Perdue. I have checked with the governor's office and the, uh, I am told that the governor has no opposition to this bill. So uh, I, I take it that means that uh, with today's vote and the Senate vote and the governor having no opposition that it will become law. The governor has 10 days to sign the bill into law or it automatically takes effect. The governor's signature makes the charter school bill into law effective July 1st, 2011. The House approved new tax credits to pay private school tuition for children who receive daily special education services. Supporters say helping special needs students using a tuition tax credit will help families and save the state education dollars, but opponents say this is step one of a process that could undermine public school funding. That's about $24 million in credits going to parents, savings to the state, appropriate education for children. This is a win, win, win. We're taking money out of our tax system, money that is paid by poor people, which I keep saying, poor, and we are, and we are appropriating, we're giving it to people who already have means. That tax credit could total $6,000 per school year for qualifying families. The Senate voted to guarantee all low-income North Carolina school children a free school breakfast. The bill would cover children who currently receive reduced cost meals. If state funds do not exist when this program would launch, then reduced prices would continue for school breakfast, but the House still needs to vote on this bill to make it law. A bill that would have required principals to ask enrolling students of their immigration status cleared the House this week without that provision in it. The impression was that this bill would then be non-controversial. Turned out that was only an impression. Supporters of the Safe Students Act argue that the state should know the impact of illegal immigration on North Carolina schools. The bill that passed the House was stripped of some key language that would have required principals to ask enrolling students about their immigration status. What was left over would require all students to prove they've been immunized and verify their birth date before enrollment. Number one is to ensure that all children who are in our public schools are immunized. And number two, for educational delivery purposes, to make sure that we know the age of the people who are in our public school. 
which is important when you're six or when you're 16. Students without official birth certificates could submit religious or other secondary documents attesting to their age, but Representative Rick Glazier says even that could present hurdles to some students. If in fact a child comes and doesn't have the certified certificate or the secondary proof required here, will that, children be, will that child be barred from school because he can't prove his age? And the answer the staff said is yes. Representative Dale Falwell says public health needs require a focus on school immunization and a child's age, it makes a big difference in giving them an appropriate education. If we're going to have standards in North Carolina for public education, it needs to be for everybody if it's going to be for anybody. The proposed school policy would take effect next school year. This bill sits in the Senate. A bipartisan effort could set new state policy requiring public school students to study the founding principles of the United States. Students would learn about the separation of powers, certain inalienable rights that are granted by the Creator, equal justice under the law, the Bill of Rights and Due Process, a few other uh, ideas behind the founding principles. They'd have to pass this class before graduating high school. We are failing our students if we don't transmit to the coming generation those principles that have made America great, America strong, and America free. Here we go again, uh, getting this body to start dictating what courses should be taught and, what you, and how it should be taught and whether or not these kids in school, instead of leaving it up to local boards of education. The new American history courses would not launch until the 2014 school year. The House voted on some modest reforms to the state worker pension policies. Reform supporters say they had an initial list of reforms that was quite long but got reduced down to two measures. Those were the only items all parties could agree to implement. State employees would vest in the retirement system after 10 years of service, not five. It would become a crime to cash a deceased state employee's retirement check or claim their benefits. The House also approved some new policies for state health plan customers. Retired military members could take state jobs and still participate in TRICARE. Members would receive rewards for finding medical billing errors. The state health plan would move to calendar year enrollment beginning in January of each year. And people seeking emergency treatment would be given an accident questionnaire to find out what happened. The full House launched into a hot, hot debate over a bill called the Women's Right to Know Act. That would require that women seeking an elective abortion receive state-mandated information, get a pre-abortion ultrasound, and then wait 24 hours. A bill cleared the House this week that would slow a woman's elective abortion process by at least 24 hours and after she received mandatory information and a pre-abortion ultrasound. Supporters say they want these women better informed about the abortion process, but pro-choice lawmakers say this is a new round of attacks on a woman's right to choose. When it comes to the decision about an abortion, it is also a very important decision that needs time and needs to make sure that people have full information to make the decision that is best for them to live with for their entire life. And we believe that there is a way to address that that respects the women and the, and the lives that they are carrying. House Bill 854 defines what doctors must tell a pregnant woman about her requested abortion and how they must tell them. Bill supporters say these mandatory provisions, including the ultrasound, will allow for informed consent by the pregnant woman. They should have every bit of information before they make that all important decision. This is not about taking a woman's right away to have an abortion. This is about giving her the knowledge she needs. A state may not, under the law of this country, under the guise of securing informed consent, require the delivery of information designed to influence the woman's informed choice between childbirth and abortion, and rigid requirements, and the ones in this bill are stone-like. Bill opponents say women have freedom, and they have choices as adults. No woman can call herself free who does not own and control her own body. Those words are as true today as they were many years ago when Margaret Sanger made them. Legislative fiscal analysts estimate the Woman's Right to Know Act would cost the state 
between six and seven million dollars a year, most of that being in Medicaid expenses. It's also estimated that more women would choose to keep their pregnancies after hearing required information, seeing the ultrasound, and then waiting a mandatory 24 hours before an elective abortion could take place. Doctors could perform immediate abortions if medical conditions threaten a woman's life under this bill. The Senate unanimously passed a House bill that reforms workers' compensation laws in North Carolina. It's House Bill 709, and it would end the practice of disabled workers receiving permanent benefits under a temporary benefits program. They'll stop at 500 weeks. Then the disabled worker would be reviewed for permanent disability. The bill also redefines suitable employment should a job be offered to a disabled worker. The reforms do not affect current workers' comp recipients, a key compromise to getting this bill passed. The Senate overwhelmingly approved legislation to ensure that illegal immigrants not receive most public services. Services. Any person seeking local, state, or federal government benefits would offer official state or federal identification or tribal documentation. Any benefits that are offered regardless of immigration status would be exempt from the state ID requirement. I would say that of all the correspondence, emails, and uh, that I have had this session probably more has been related to this bill than any other. Government workers would be required to report immigration law violations or face misdemeanor charges. State agencies screen newly hired employees using the federal E-Verify program. It checks out your U.S. immigration status. House Bill 36 would extend immigration screenings to cover businesses holding state government contracts and local governments and their contractors. The bill passed the House earlier this week. Supporters of expanding E-Verify immigration checks to state contractors, their subcontractors, and local governments and their contractors say this bill is a jobs bill, that it ensures legal residents are being hired for American jobs. The Supreme Court has ruled that states have the authority to require employers to use the E-Verify system and to have sanctions against those that don't. House Bill 36 would require the state contractors and companies doing business with local governments screen their new employees just as state agencies do in confirming an applicant's immigration status. I came down here to unburden people with government regulation. I came down here to make things work better, to find ways to be more efficient, not to find ways to be more cumbersome and more difficult and impose the government further in private business. The 75-43 vote reveals bipartisan House support for expanding E-Verify requirements into the private sector. That support includes the possibility that some companies will face fines for every employee that is not screened for immigration status under this bill. The E-Verify bill would allow employers to be fined $2,000 for every new employee they do not screen using E-Verify. The House backed the Electoral Freedom Act this week. It would make it easier for third-party and independent candidates to appear on North Carolina ballots. Small political parties would need petitions featuring many thousands of fewer qualifying signatures to get their candidates on the ballot. Supporters say that Democrats and Republicans have come together to push relaxed ballot standards for these independent and third-party candidates. But opponents say this is a two-party system we have that works quite well and promotes healthy debate. It lowers the threshold for new political parties from having to go out and get 2% of the registered voters um, to back to a quarter percent of the, of the voters. The difference is meaning about 85,000 signatures versus 10,000 signatures. We are a two-party state, and I think this just tends to give credibility to some fringe factions on both sides of the spectrum. And I don't know that the public's interest is best served by that. Political party primary losers could not launch a petition drive in hopes of running in the general election under this bill. The Senate voted 3017 this week to end straight party voting as a one-punch option on state ballots. Current North Carolina ballots exclude the U.S. presidential race from straight party options. Sponsors say 34 other states do not have straight party balloting. Uh, opponents say the polls will have to stay open longer and voters will be slowed down and inconvenienced by punching a name in each political race on the ballot. 
They also believe this bill could violate the Federal Voting Rights Act. Democrat and Republican House members drew some clear lines over voter ID legislation that passed Thursday. Republican supporters say our electoral integrity is being threatened by a system that takes a voter's word as acceptable identification. Democrats see a method for reducing Democratic votes. The House held a very partisan debate over requiring state voters to show photo identification at the polling place. When the election is fair, the votes are cast fairly, it protects everyone. Republicans say this issue should not be partisan, but Democrats say photo ID requirements would affect many types of people who vote Democratic. They say a bill fighting voter fraud is unnecessary because there's so little fraud reported. If you talk about having five instances of reported voter fraud per million voters voting, does that sound like a problem to you? Not five convictions, five instances of reports of voting fraud. But Representative Rick Killian says his constituents report to him some worry that anyone could enter a polling place and vote under another person's name. The concerns that I hear from my constituents and citizens around my area are that they simply, in the current process, don't have the confidence that when they go to vote, their vote is being cast solely for their name. Voters without identification could receive a free state-issued voter identification card with their picture on it. Voters who have no ID at all, not even the free state-issued ID card, could still vote but by provisional ballot. County boards of election would determine the validity of any provisional ballots cast. A bipartisan vote in the House approves the creation of a nonpartisan independent redistricting commission. Its job would be redrawing congressional and state legislative district boundaries. The commission would be staffed by professionals, not politicians, but General Assembly would hold the final approval over the district maps that are drawn. The bill carried overwhelming support, but some skeptics say giving lawmakers final approval over redistricting undercuts the independent independence of this proposed commission. It has uh, professional staff, uh, disinterested persons, if you will, uh, draw maps, but still preserves the right of the legislature to vote on the maps. The plan coming from this nonpartisan redistricting simply comes to the General Assembly, quietly gets voted down twice, and on the third try, the General Assembly draws their own districts. Gun rights supporting lawmakers successfully earned House approval of a proposal known as the Castle Doctrine. The Castle Doctrine would give people a right to use lethal self-defense to protect their lives if they feel a person is a mortal threat. Other parts of this bill relax laws that currently restrict where lawfully permitted gun owners may take their weapons. The House's package of gun law reforms would set in stone the right to use lethal self-defense if you believe your life is in danger. Self-defense measures could be taken inside your home, but also in your vehicle and in the workplace, and a person fearing for his or her life would not face civil or criminal liability. The National Rifle Association looked at our state, compared it with other states, and uh, asked that this bill would be introduced to bring us in conformity with other states across the, the country. Another bill provision would have prevented private property owners from outlawing concealed weapons on their property as long as the gun was locked up in the permitted gun owner's vehicle. That provision drew some sharp disagreement between Republicans over property rights. It also drew an amendment that ultimately restored landowners and employers' ability to keep their property gun free. Second Amendment doesn't trump the Fifth Amendment. Um, there is a potential conflict here, but um, the, my f personal property rights, private property rights, ought to, um, in this case, um, be um, protected. Bill supporters are very quick to note that this bill affects only gun owners who possess active concealed carry gun permits. And while private property owners can declare their property gun free, Public properties like school grounds and highway rest stops would be open to concealed carry if the guns are locked away inside the gun owner's vehicle.
Castle Doctrine legislation has been filed in previous legislative sessions without success. Now, over in the Senate, it passed its own version of the Castle Doctrine, allowing people to protect themselves inside their homes or workplaces and vehicles. This bill carries many provisions you'll find in the House bill, but this legislation defines the situations when a person is protected from criminal and civil liability for using lethal self-defense. It also outlines situations when a person could not claim Castle Doctrine protection. I think this bill is a common sense um, effort to try to expand our rights in ways that can protect the public. The bill contains other provisions allowing concealed carry permit holders to possess a weapon in public parks. It also would let district attorneys and their assistants carry firearms in certain places under certain circumstances. The Senate passed and sent to the House some new regulations for hunters who hunt on private property. The Landowner Protection Act will make hunters carry a landowner's written permission on them while they're hunting. Law enforcement officers could ask for that slip on demand. Bill supporters say this idea reinforces courteous behavior and also makes sure hunters aren't sneaking onto private property despite being <laughs> properly licensed. The House passed legislation to end the state's practice of floating bonds without voter approval. Republicans are citing the state constitution and calling for a ban on using certificates of participation. Democrats say some state projects are more efficiently handled by non-voter approved debt. The House debated then approved the ending of state issued bond debt without state voter approval. Voters have not approved a state bond referendum since the year 2000, but the state has issued bonds without asking voter approval using certificates of participation. I don't know how we misinterpret these words. The General Assembly shall have no power to contract debts secured by a pledge of the faith and credit of the state unless approved by a majority of the qualified voters of the state who vote. COPS does not pledge the full faith and credit of the state, so that's why uh, it is surely constitutional to do COPS. Democrats who were in leadership when certificates of participation were issued last decade say some projects are necessary but aren't glamorous or don't generate popular appeal in spite of their importance. That's why they argue non-voter approved state debt is necessary at times. To do away with them entirely is, um, is the wrong thing. If you put a cap on how much you could do at one time or something like that, something like that may be something that we could compromise on, but I, I, I hope that you won't make this mistake. But suddenly in 2000, we're just, I mean, 2004, we're just quite, we just need that extra tool in the toolbox. I'm sorry, but I respectfully disagree. As this bill heads over to the Senate, so does the potential that North Carolina will not be approving any new bonds unless you, the voter, give the okay. The last bond issue approved by state voters was over 10 years ago, the higher education bond. UNCTV received some funding from those bonds. The Senate moved on its medical malpractice reform bill this week. It also cleared the House late Thursday night. The GOP made some changes to it that gained Democratic support. This bill protects emergency room doctors who make medical mistakes under professional duress. It caps non-economic damages at $500,000. The bill heads to Governor Purdue's desk for her signature. The House approves a few elections and campaign reforms affecting instant runoff voting, public financing of some Council of State races, and even the nonpartisan nature of judicial races. Some parts of this bill carried huge majority support, but not all of it. House Bill 452 would change a few things about state election laws. The first being that instant runoff voting for judicial offices would end. Public financing for three Council of State races, that being the State Auditor, State Superintendent of Public Instruction, and the Insurance Commission race, that would end too. Judicial candidates would be allowed to announce a political party affiliation. If we start subjecting them to these party primaries, we're going to lose some of our best and brightest judges. I've spent many hours at polls helping voters identify who is which party. They all know. We've got to stop hiding the ball. 
There was some bipartisan appeal to ending instant runoff elections for judicial races, but party disagreement erupted over ending public financing of those three council of state races. Many Democrats say it's public financing that lessens the appearance that campaign contributors may be currying favor with candidates seeking a council of state seat. It's an important anti-corruption tool, an anti-special interest tool to make sure that the people in, in these offices can focus on one thing, and that's representing the best interests of North Carolina. The House's 67-51 vote sends it to the Senate. While public financing is eliminated for three council of state races, some judicial races will maintain a public campaign financing program. Find us this weekend as you surf the internet. We would love to hear from you. Make us your friend at Facebook, facebook.com slash legweek. Email us, legweek at unctv.org. And we're on Twitter. The show's handle is at NCN Legweek. I'm also on Twitter under my name. You can search for at Kelly McCullum. This show is streamed online 24-7 at unctv.org slash legweek. That's our show for this week. We certainly hope to see you next time. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.